Who's my favorite singer? Saint. 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 Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we could hear that too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it's very difficult to choose a favorite saint, but um, my favorite saint is Saint Maximus the Confessor. Um, and yes, he's a very difficult writer. His Greek is immensely dense, but um, he repays special study. But um, I'll mention other of my favorite saints, theologian saints. Uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa I love very much. Saint Simeon, the new theologian, I love because of his warmth, his emphasis on the closeness of the Holy Spirit to us, and I also uh, feel very close to St. Gregory Palamas. But they're all theologian saints. Um, yes, now, is the liturgy too complicated? It is true that it is an elaborate service that takes time. Personally, I find the elaboration of the service part of its beauty, and I would not want to see things cut down to a bare minimum. I don't myself find the service too long, but I may be prejudiced as a bishop. Um, <laughs> however, of course, when you have a bishop celebrating, it takes a good deal longer than other times, so um, I have to get accustomed to long services. But a great deal depends, I think, on the way that the liturgy is celebrated. And I favor a fairly open way of celebrating the liturgy. I wouldn't wish to see the icon screen altogether disappear, but I think it's good when the icon screen is not so solid as totally to conceal the celebrant from view. I am in favor of saying at any rate some of the prayers, especially the prayers of the consecration, allowed because so much of the theology of the liturgy is contained in the priest's prayers and I feel it is a great pity that um, the priest's prayers are not heard by the people. So I think it is possible to celebrate the liturgy with simplicity and it is possible for the parish priest to give liturgical sermons and explain the meaning of the liturgy. And then I feel its meaning is not too much hidden. There are, yes, great depths in the liturgy and I felt this evening I was only just skimming the surface in what I said. As you saw, I didn't get much beyond the opening blessing. But um, at the same time, the meaning of the liturgy can be understood quite simply. And especially the meaning of the consecration that at that moment, the bread and wine are truly transformed into the body and blood of Christ, and he is present with us in the most direct way. And so, Holy Communion is the crucial, culminating encounter of the believer with his or her Savior. These are things which surely can be explained simply.
simply and can be understood by all. So yes, there's a lot about the liturgy that is mysterious, but we can understand the basic structure and movement of the different parts. I do truly believe that if you have a good liturgical catechesis, the people will understand. But we need to work on that. This may tie to that. Could you talk just a little, about, because you emphasize the participation of all, could you speak just a little about the different modes of participation? Participation, some people feel, means doing everything, and it doesn't necessarily. So we should talk about the different ways we participate. Yes. Um, that's a very important question and could be answered in many ways. But first of all, we participate by making the sign of the cross at decisive moments. There is indeed freedom, but we do not all have to make the sign of the cross at the same time uh, in our orthodox usage. So uh, people may feel free, but there are going to be certain moments when nearly everybody will make the sign of the cross. And that surely is a moment of participation. And here I would appeal to you, when you make the sign of the cross, do it properly. <laughs> Don't just do that. Um, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is a proclamation of our faith and it shouldn't be done carelessly. So yes, that is one very important way of participating. And when we make the sign of the cross, Often it is a way of saying inwardly, I seal this moment, these words, I make them my own. So that's first of all. I value the Russian custom whereby when people come into the church, they buy one or two little loaves and they send up their loaves with names to be prayed for and particles from those loaves will be placed on the pattern and eventually placed inside the chalice with the precious blood of Christ. Um, I know that in the Greek use it is the custom usually for one or two families in the parish to prepare the uh, bread for the Eucharist um, and there too of course when they prepare the loaf they send in uh, their list of names with the loaf but the Russian use where nearly everybody sends up little loaves that again is a way of being involved in the action of the liturgy of knowing that your names are being prayed for of course you can send up a list of names without a loaf and they will also be prayed for but that's a second manner of participation to feel that on the pattern there are particles of bread that represent you and your loved ones living and departed and that they are all being prayed for if not allowed by name at least inwardly and spiritually during the liturgy and this I think emphasizes the corporate nature of the liturgy. Saint Augustine commenting on this says, there you are on the altar, there you are in the chalice. So that's a second way. Um, of course it's a question often raised, should we not have more congregational singing. And I have to say that when I have been to those rather rare Orthodox parishes where all the congregation do sing together, I am deeply moved. There is, of course, a recognized place 
for the chanters or the choir and this was the case from the days of the early church but there were parts of the service which in the early church would have been sung by all the people together could we not all sing Kyrie eleison together in the litanies and when we come to the antiphons at the beginning of the service the chanters can sing the verse bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name but then couldn't all the people sing together because the melody is very simple at the prayers of the mother of God Savior save us couldn't we all sing that now I've been to churches where that does happen I also remember when I first went to Russia during the Soviet era when only a few churches were open and they were very crowded how according to the Russian tradition the creed and the Lord's Prayer are not just read they are sung and everybody sang together and that was to me uh, tremendously moving to hear the creed and the Lord's Prayer being sung by thousands of voices so I think there is a place certainly for the trained choir and the singers such moments as the hymn of the cherubim or the communion hymn the kinonikon and other points but the, could we not also revive in our Orthodox churches congregational singing but the most important way that we participate is of course by coming to Holy Communion and in my time as an Orthodox I've seen a big change there that I can remember in the church at Oxford when I was a layman on some Sundays nobody came for communion at all the priest said with fear of God with faith and love draw near and the congregation rejected the invitation now that would never happen today in Oxford I do not say that everyone goes every Sunday to communion and I think that's not necessarily desirable but there are always flocks of communicants though we are not such a big community we always consecrate two chalices because we are usually two priests celebrating together so that is the supreme way we share in the divine liturgy through having communion but while I am in favor of frequent communion I am not in favor of casual communion we should not come just on the spur of the moment we have to examine ourselves as St Paul says and to discern the Lord's body to realize what it is we are receiving so communion should always have careful preparation it should always be an event something we look forward to not something that we take for granted